Hey, small group leaders. It's great to connect with you again through this video. I just wanted to, uh, again, encourage you and let you know that um, you're all doing a fantastic job facilitating this gentle and lowly study. And I just wanted to give you, again, just some reminders. Now, we're now in the three, third week of the study, and perhaps uh, I know one group has discussed this. I'm not sure if others have. But sometimes when we are continuing to emphasize the same thing about anyone, including Jesus, we can sometimes have the attitude, mentality of, can we just move on with this? Haven't we exhausted this conversation enough? And I want to remind you about what Scripture says about meditating on the Scripture. From Joshua 1.8, it says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. So remember that in our culture, we don't emphasize slowing down with the Lord very much because our culture doesn't allow us to slow down with the Lord. We are so interested in uh, getting a quick fix to be challenged and open our Bibles. And many times we lose sight of the depth, especially of Christ and how the Lord magnifies his glory in the text. So it also says in Joshua 1.8 here, be careful to do everything that's written in it. It means that it's not something that comes natural to us to be careful to obey and to consider what God's Word says. We have to remind ourselves, God has to remind ourselves to be careful. So just a challenge for us that this is a great call for us to slow down with the Scripture, to allow the Spirit of God to speak to us. I'll add one more thing on that same topic. Uh, Piper talks about this. And he says this about beholding glory. It says, beholding glory begs for lingering. The modern face, fast paced will tempt you to rush and to skim. This kind of life will make you shallow. The world doesn't need more widely read shallow people. It needs deep people. And he clarifies what he means by that. He doesn't mean complex. He doesn't mean highly educated. It doesn't mean even using big words. It doesn't mean that you even know the historical background. It means that you have seen the glory of God in his word, and you have been steadied and satisfied with it. This is what he means by deep. And so just remember that and be challenged yourselves and also be challenged for what the Lord wants to speak to you about. So this week, we're focusing on two chapters um, from Gentle and Lowly, chapter 6 and 7. And I'm going to ask you as facilitators, again, to open up in prayer and then to read the scripture together. Now, there is Hosea 11 that is talked about in chapter 7, which I'm sure will happen through as you go through the study guide to answer questions. But more so importantly, let's focus on John chapter 6 and Jesus and how he presents himself as the bread of life. The question and comment that they have to Jesus is, give us this bread always. They want the bread of life. And Jesus talks to them in saying that whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So I'm calling you to read John 6, 32 through 37 together in your group. Repeat that several times as you're reading and just have people observe what they're reading before you get into the small group questions, before you get into the video for the study. So I just want to let you know that I'm praying for you, praying for your groups. I know our own group has been very refreshing and challenging. Keep your heads up and be encouraged, and the Lord will continue to have all of us go deep in really finding our hope in Christ. And just continue to pray for your groups beforehand, that the Holy Spirit would continue to magnify the greatness of Christ's heart for sinners. Have a great week, and we'll touch base later.
chapter 6 of Gentle and Lowly focuses on one of the most arresting statements in all of the Bible, where Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And then he says, And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. John Bunyan was one of the Puritans. He was the, the earthy, uneducated Puritan, very different from someone like John Owen or Thomas Goodwin. And Bunyan, uh, as you look at his writings, apparently this was his favorite verse in all the Bible. He quotes it time and again. And in one of his books, one of his 60-some books, he comes and uh, focuses, zeroes in on that one verse, especially the second half, all who come to me I will never cast out. And in his book, Come and Welcome to Jesus Christ, what a glorious, comforting title. In that book, Bunyan wants us to uh, see there is no reason we can ever give the Lord Jesus Christ to close off his heart from us. So he spends those uh, page after page just shutting down any possible reason for us to think Christ will at some point kick us out. He goes from one reason to another to insist that his patience never wears thin. We are a fountain of reasons in our own mind and heart to think that he is growing impatient with us. We are constantly, we're like a factory of new resistances to believing that Jesus Christ will never cast us out. As we just navigate normal life with our ongoing uh, sin and stupid decisions and folly, as we go through life and are making one mistake after another with what we eat and what we drink and what we're looking at online and our inability to uh, open our mouth and share the gospel with our next door neighbor and are constantly losing our temper perhaps or whatever your sort of habitual uh, sin that causes you to deeply become discouraged in your walk with the Lord is. Maybe it's not a particular sin, but just a, a feeling flat and bored and empty and hollow in your walk with the Lord. Even that can cause us to be deeply discouraged. But what Bunyan wants us to see from John chapter 6 is that our very regret and shame and feelings of guilt is what the Lord Jesus came to absorb and to heal and to overcome. That's what he came to fix. The only deadly thing is for us to hold back and to stay cowering, withdrawing, and not come to him. The text says, anyone who comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus doesn't stiff arm you when you come to him with new, fresh guilt. The text says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. It doesn't say whoever comes to me with a sufficient level of contrition or whoever comes to me feeling bad enough for what they have done. Simply, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus Christ would have to be pulled down out of heaven and put back in the grave of Joseph of Arimathea in order for you or I, anyone who is in him, to get kicked out of his own heart. Chapter 7 of the book is the first time that we go to the Old Testament to begin to see and to show that the God of the Old Testament is not different than what we see of God incarnate, Jesus Christ, in the New Testament and his heart in Matthew 11 and other places in the New Testament. Actually, God in the Old Testament is perfectly and beautifully consistent with that. So let me ask you to turn in your Bible with me to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 11, where we read in verse 8, verses 8 and 9 are really the key verses of Hosea 11, although the whole chapter gives us the context for understanding verses 8 and 9. Uh, in verse 8, we read this. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? This is God speaking to his people. Again, if we read the full context of Hosea 11, clearly this is God speaking to his wayward his sinful people. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? Ephraim is God's sort of title for his, it's his affectionate title for his people. It's what he calls his people when he wants them to know he is using a term of affection, endearment. How can I give you up, O Ephraim, 
How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? These are the enemies of God's people. My heart, there it is, my heart recoils within me. What a statement. My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. Verse 9, I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For, why? For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. That's an astonishing statement of what God says there. When you think the holiness of God, what do you think? This is God's otherness, the way he's not like us. And here in this text, we read, I will not come in wrath because he's the Holy One of Israel. We would expect God to say, would we not? I am the Holy One of Israel, therefore I will come in wrath. But he is so unlike us. He is so non-exasperated by his people's sin. He's, he is so overflowingly compassionate. His heart is <laughs> recoiling within him and growing warm and tender that he will not come in wrath. What he will eventually finally do, will he discipline his people? Yes. Will he chastise them? Yes. He loves us too much not to. But his end result reaction to us, response to us, what he will do is not come in wrath, but in mercy. That's not how our hearts work. Your heart and mine, even as regenerate, born-again people of God, at reflex level, we don't have that natural response to other people's sin. But God is not like us. So take the rest of your life, your Christian life, from now until the day you die, and let the scripture tear down how you and I naturally picture God, what we view he is instinctively, reflexively in all of his holiness like. And let the scripture build up a new and glorious and beautiful picture of who God is, namely the Holy One of Israel, who, according to his own testimony, will not come in wrath.